This summer marks 30 years since The Fugitive first went on the run, or was released, you know, from prison. And as a longtime fan of this film, I thought it was the perfect time to revisit it and also give me a good opportunity to discuss an actor that I haven't talked about that much before, that being Harrison Ford. But before I do that, I would be remiss if I were to talk about it and not mention the phenomenal TV series upon which it is based, also called The Fugitive, coincidentally enough. It was created by Roy Huggins and starred David Jansen as Dr. Richard Kimball. I love this show. I was actually introduced to it as a little kid when I watched the finale, Two-Parter, which was hugely popular when it first aired. I have not watched the finale since then, but I just remember that it was in color and a good portion of it took place at an amusement park. But more recently, I have gone back and been watching the series from the beginning. I still have quite a bit of it left to watch, but it's incredible. David Jansen is an amazing actor, and his presence is a huge part of what makes the show work. He's able to convey the hunted, wary look of a man that's constantly looking over his shoulder to perfection. It's in his body language, his facial expressions, the way he hesitates before looking someone in the eye, and all of this brings so much tension to the show. And also, it's his compassion that he brings to it that rounds out this character. He's not simply a selfish guy trying to save himself. He's constantly putting his skills to use to help others, or trying to get someone out of trouble. He's this wandering Good Samaritan that also has a dogged detective on his tail at all times. The show also looks wonderful, especially in black and white. The noir-style imagery never gets old. And I love how different each episode is. Far from being formulaic, each episode can be free to be set in a different location. And with him constantly taking different jobs, the possibilities are endless. Whether he's a construction worker trying to stick up for another man on the crew, or helping a woman deliver a baby who's suddenly gone into labor, or getting arrested by a local cop for getting into a fistfight and just hoping his newest alias holds up under scrutiny. The show is a classic, and I strongly suggest anyone check it out if they haven't already. But I'm here to talk about the movie, directed by Andrew Davis and starring Harrison Ford and Tommy Lee Jones. In case you aren't aware, here's the general idea for the plot of the movie and setup of the series that preceded it. Dr. Richard Kimball is wrongfully convicted of murdering his wife and is sentenced to death. On the way to death row, he manages to escape and goes on the run. Never far behind is a very determined lawman named Gerard. I first watched this movie when I was quite young, and to this day, those opening scenes depicting quick, flashing images of the murder of Dr. Kimball's wife are frightening. I remember finding those moments almost too much for me as a young kid, and it's a credit to the movie that even as an adult, they still are just as gripping and brutal. As I said at the start, the movie came out 30 years ago, to much success. It was a huge box office winner, and even managed to get nominated for seven Oscars, but winning only one. Which brings me to a little grievance I have with the Academy. Not about being nominated for all these awards, I think it is very deserving of each of them, even Best Picture. Again, it takes a person back to a time when actually enjoyable movies that the majority of audiences are interested in would at least get nominated. But no, my big beef with the Oscars is that the fugitive himself, Harrison Ford, was not nominated for Best Actor, because he is fantastic in the movie, without looking at anything else. Just watch his performance in the scenes in the interrogation room after his wife has been killed, or the moments in the courtroom as he's listening to his wife's 911 call. The rest of his performance is great as well, but those two scenes represent some of the best acting that Harrison Ford has ever done, and I think it's a real shame that he wasn't recognized for it. Leaving out the long list of classic Hollywood actors that I would rank as my favorites, Harrison Ford is near the top of my favorite list for what I'll call more modern actors. I realize the man is 80 years old at this point, but I still think of him as a newer actor. I love John Wayne and Jimmy Stewart. What can I say? What Harrison Ford has always done in the action or thriller genres, from Indiana Jones to Jack Ryan to his character in Firewall, a movie that no one else except me seems to like, is play the everyman like no one else. He is very seldom skilled in what he needs to do to survive the movie and appears to be hanging on for dear life as he's hurtled through the plot. And it's that skill, that shaky running, fumbled punching, wide-eyed shock, that makes him the perfect man to play Richard Kimball in this movie. It's a different performance than David Jansen's, but both are playing in the same sandbox. He's given those little moments that we're always paid attention to in the show as well, the tensing up in his shoulders as a police car passes, or tucking his chin down into his collar as he walks through a crowd. Harrison Ford makes this character so sympathetic. Something I really noticed upon this viewing was how little Harrison Ford speaks for large portions of the movie. And I wonder if that's a reason for why he never even got nominated for an Oscar. So much of the time, he's this lone man 
trying to figure out how to live and investigate his wife's murder without getting caught. Toward the end, he does get to interact with more characters, but it just made me wonder if that's why he was underrated. It reminded me of how people were counting the lines of dialogue that Matt Damon had in the last Bourne movie. I say if the character is still on screen and dialogue isn't necessary, there's no need to shoehorn it in just to make it seem like he's doing more. I will say, Harrison Ford is just as compelling as he's making his way through the streets of Chicago, accompanied only by the score, as when he's yelling at the villain during a speech at the end. Maybe more so. The Man on His Tail is played by Tommy Lee Jones, who won the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. He's great as Deputy U.S. Marshal Sam Gerard, and is very different from Lieutenant Philip Gerard, as played by Barry Morris in the show. The first difference is that there is nothing personal about his pursuit for Kimball. In the show, Gerard feels a sense of personal responsibility, as he was handcuffed to Kimball when the train derailed, and feels that he lost him, and it's his duty to get him back. But with Tommy Lee Jones, the key difference comes from the fact that he is now a U.S. Marshal, not a police detective. And U.S. Marshals, as Gerard says in the movie, hunt down fugitives. They don't solve crimes. So there's a detachment there that allows this to be just another job for him. At first, Kimball's determination to find the real killer is what leads Gerard to start to think there might be something to his story about the elusive one-armed man. And the other difference is in how he's portrayed. In the series, I, so far, have gotten the sense that he's meant to be taken as the antagonist. You look on him sometimes almost like a villain, because of how strongly he believes that Kimball did kill his wife. I should mention that Gerard only appears in the plot of 37 episodes out of the series' four seasons, but his appearance in the opening sequence always reminds you that he's out there, somewhere. But that dogged belief that Kimball is guilty can make the audience dislike him, although over time he begins to have his doubts. And you contrast that with the movie, and you're meant to like Tommy Lee Jones. There's never really a time where you're wanting Gerard to fail. He's very funny. The most obvious line that people remember is the search every farmhouse, doghouse, henhouse, and on and on, but he's very charming. So we have two very different characters in Kimball and Gerard, but the audience is kind of rooting for both. The banter he shares with his fellow marshals is great, and you have a fun, quirky group of them, including Joe Pantoliano, Daniel Roebuck, L. Scott Caldwell, and Tom Wood. They aren't very deep characters, but they all get their moments, each get some laughs, and allow Tommy Lee Jones to bounce all kinds of one-liners off of them. So Kimball isn't pursued by this unstoppable entity, like the posse in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, but instead this jokey little group that we like spending time with whenever we cut to them. For the rest of the cast, Celia Ward plays Helen Kimball. It's a brief role, only appearing in flashbacks, but she and Harrison Ford share an easy chemistry that builds their happy marriage as quickly as the movie needs them to. Jerowen Crabb plays a doctor friend of Richard Kimball's that ends up being far more villainous than Kimball ever could have imagined, and Andreas Katsoulis plays Frederick Sykes, the one-armed man that really committed the murder. He is excellent. He's a large man with a very distinctive face, and appears dangerous enough to convincingly overpower Harrison Ford in a fight, even if the character is missing one hand. And the attitude he displays when confronted by Tommy Lee Jones at one point, it's all very natural with an air of menace to him. Another great performance. There are also small roles played by Julianne Moore and Jane Lynch, both playing doctors. Each of them is almost shockingly young, and both are good in their roles. This movie has very defined acts, which I'm sure is by design. The first act is nearly flawless. Everything from the opening sequence that runs through the events leading up to the murder, to the trial and conviction, is handled so well and sets up the entire story in such a compact and succinct way. The editing is great and tells it all so clearly in this almost delirious manner. Brief shout out to the two actors that play the Chicago police detectives on the case, Ron Dean and Joseph Casala. Their performances in the interrogation scene are amazing. They're both so jaded, and clearly not believing a word that Kimball says as Kimball is breaking down in front of them. They're just so real. And then, perhaps the greatest sequence in the movie, The Escape. It's a nice update of the original show when it was just a train derailment. Here though, since prisoners aren't really transported by a train anymore, the prison bus that Kimball is on crashes onto some train tracks. And then a train comes, hits the bus, and derails. The moment when Harrison Ford is struggling to propel himself out of the bus window while the train is bearing down. So suspenseful, so full of tension. I know that means the same thing. I love it. Also, the shot of him running, hobbled by his leg chains with the train speeding up behind him. The cinematography by Michael Chapman is wonderful. Going along with that, they crashed a real, full-size train, and they made sure to get as much coverage of that as possible. Throughout that first act, there are nice helicopter shots of the wreckage with train cars jackknifed all over the place. 
The first act ends with the chase through the tunnels, climaxing with Kimball making that spectacular dive. Everything up to that moment is relentless, a breathless chase. And then the movie slows down a little, and we see Kimball begin to settle into fugitive mode. He dyes his hair darker, and another nod to the series, and begins investigating the murder himself. This carries on until the sequence on St. Patrick's Day. Now that I'm building my original series knowledge, the idea for that scene is somewhat borrowed from Never Wave Goodbye, a two-parter from the first season where Kimball tracks down a one-armed man and goes to visit him in prison, only to find it's the wrong man. And then Gerard happens to show up in the same building, but on a different floor. Harrison Ford does that same thing, and the chase that follows has always been one of the highlights for me. The chase in the stairwell and Kimball rushing up to some cops to report a man waving a gun and screaming is that perfect mix of tension and humor that I find makes this movie work as well as it does. And the St. Patrick's Day Parade to close it out, filmed during the actual annual parade in Chicago, there's a focus on showing real people and non-actors in the movie that grounds this story and brings out the realism in what could otherwise be just an escapist action movie. I would say the last act is the weakest aspect of the movie. There's a bit of a time jump, illustrated in a shot when Harrison Ford comes into frame, then turns around to show how the hair dye has disappeared over time. I do like his costume for this portion. The tweed jacket and tie are a great visual reference to the costumes of David Jansen's Richard Kimball, but I just find the whole pharmaceutical company cover-up and all of that a little convoluted. That might be owing to me having gotten to know this movie when I was much younger and having no idea what was happening at the time, or it could be because the script was being rewritten throughout the production. Either way, the ending confrontation at a doctor's convention and the fight that follows are all well filmed. They're trying to go for a big, climactic set piece type of vibe with helicopters and being on the roof of a building, and it works pretty well, but the best part of the finale might be the fight on the train with the one-armed man. It gets quite violent, with a police officer being gunned down in the middle of things, but I love Harrison Ford's fight style. The punches are slow and feel heavy and seem to be taking as much out of him as they are hurting the one-armed man. The score was by James Newton Howard, and I think it's excellent. When you really start to take note of how good it is, is during the chase after the ambulance that Kimball has stolen. The quieter moments are good too, but anytime a chase begins and the score kicks into high gear, it gets really, really good. Getting back to the series again, so much of it would focus on Kimball trying to help people that he met along the way, while dealing with his own problems at all times. And the movie pretty much plants a miniature episode of the show in the middle of it. Kimball isn't really working as a janitor, but he's posing as one in a hospital where he's trying to get information on amputees. And during this, he ends up being asked to bring a little boy to a different ward of the hospital. A quick view of the boy's x-rays and his chart tells Kimball all he needs, and he redirects the boy to surgery, where he's looked after immediately. And then Julianne Moore's character gets wise to him and alerts security, and he has to make his escape. It's basically the plot of an episode squeezed into one scene, and I think it's brilliant. The movie and the series can both exist independent of one another while showing us a similar story with key differences. There are references to the show, which I've been mentioning, but they are by no means necessary to understand the movie. They're just fun to pick up on as a fan. The show waited until episode 14, The Girl from Little Egypt, to illustrate what actually happened to Kimball's wife. Each episode would begin with a brief summation of the night of his escape, but they did not start the pilot episode off with the full story, which is quite bold. The main difference between the movie and the series is that in the movie, the Kimballs had a perfectly happy relationship, and the murder is chalked up to him wanting to collect insurance money. The show is darker in that respect, where Kimball does have an apparent motive. The flashbacks in The Girl from Little Egypt show us that they lost a baby, and the surgery resulted in Helen Kimball not being able to have children in future. This led to their marriage crumbling, having many fights that were audible to their neighbors, and his last having seen her after a loud argument. This makes Richard Kimball in the series almost a more tragic, guilt-ridden figure, but also very chivalrous, trying to get justice for a woman that he still loved, but perhaps no longer loved him at the time of her death. The sunnier take in the movie is different, and I'm very okay with that, it's just an interesting deviation that sets the two apart. The movie is PG-13, and it could be because it's shot in the 90s and going for a somewhat gritty look at times, but I love when a PG-13 movie feels like it's made for adults. I'm no proponent of R-rated movies, but I'm a huge supporter of a movie that treats its audience like an adult, which is why more movies like this should exist. With R ratings, filmmakers have, frankly, too much freedom to dive into unnecessary profanity and scenes that no one needs to see. But when a movie is able to look and feel like it's meant to be taken seriously and not watered down, but still all right to be viewed by younger viewers mature enough to handle it, that's the perfect combination. We need more movies like The Fugitive today. So, 
If it's been a while since you last watched The Fugitive, why not seek it out again in honor of its 30th anniversary? If you haven't seen it, I probably spoiled a good deal of it, but I still highly recommend it. And the series, which I ended up talking about more than I'd planned, is simply classic television that is unlike anything else on TV. Thanks so much for watching my review. If you enjoyed it, I hope you'll check out some more of my reviews on Hildebrand Productions. Thanks again, and adios for now.